both of you, and it's really a privilege to be here. Um, this will be, uh, as far as I can tell, the first um, of the um, webinar series that actually deals directly with uh, a key living resource, the American lobster. And um, before I get into this, I just want to acknowledge um, uh, a number of people who have been involved with the research over the years or helped um, contribute uh, some data for this presentation and others. Um, so uh, that list there, including Mike Fogarty from, from uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and um, uh, Lou Inza, Pete Lott and Bob Stenick, Carl Wilson, Fiji Su, Yu Maine, a bunch of collaborators um, in U.S. and Canada uh, involved with the American Lobster Settlement Index, that's ALSI, and then funding from various uh, groups from NSF to the state agencies. Um, and also I want to make a special acknowledgement to the previous presenters of the NECAN um, webinars. This has uh, truly been an education for me, and I've uh, watched all the, uh, all the uh, webinar presentations, and it's really been a, a crash course uh, in um, uh, carbonate chemistry for a, a neophyte. So um, let me just give you a quick overview <coughs> of, um, of the talk here, and then we'll launch right into it. Um, Dwight asked me to um, give a, sort of a broad background on the, on the challenges that facing uh, the American lobster fishery, and, um, and then delve into um, any evidence that there might be um, for sensitivity of this species to changes in carbon chemistry. So this talk will be really very much front-loaded with some, some background that will then put the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ocean acidification effects into some uh, into some context, and um, and uh, <clears throat> so um, I'll be first talking about the um, uh, what appears to be a northward shift in the fishery, um, and resulting in some dramatic uh, uh, divergence in the in the path the fishery has taken in the north and the south. Um, other effects, other than climate-related effect, effects, include um, the altered food web we're seeing as a result of fishing down the food web, but I'll end up with um, uh, a heavy dose of, um, of um, evidence of climate effects as, as well. Then I'll get into the sensitivity to changes in carbon chemistry, um, what we have of it there, that is, um, there isn't a lot on the American lobster. There's more on cru other crustaceans and invertebrates. Uh, I'll present um, the evidence from uh, three case studies on uh, lobsters and, and uh, crabs, um, and then uh, wind up with uh, a laundry list of the challenges ahead. So I, I couldn't think of a better um, way to start um, illustrating with how um, illustrating how the um, American lobster distribution has changed over the decades. Uh, Mike Fogarty put together this uh, this little video clip that um, uh, results from the uh, federal trawl surveys taken um, since 1968 through 2008. So. Um, some uh, 40 years of uh, trawl survey data. And you can see how the distribution of uh, lobsters on the shelf uh, and coastal waters has shifted from uh, the, the, southern, um, uh, the southern New England uh, shelf waters up into the Gulf of Maine and is now mostly concentrated uh, along coastal Maine and into um, uh, 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 coastal Nova Scotia where where the largest landings are at, at this time. And so um, this is the time series of, uh, of lobster landings and metric tons. Um, in the U.S. and Canada, Canada harvests about twice as much lobsters as uh, the U.S. does. Um, but uh, we've both seen, both countries have seen a pretty dramatic boom in, the, uh, in harvest that um, that uh, I'll dig into and drill into and, and um, see if we can get at uh, some of the um, 
causal agents here. Um, it's also worth mentioning something about how the value of lobsters is tracked over the uh, over the years. Before I get into the ecological uh, aspects, um, the actual price of lobsters over uh, since the 1960s is pretty well held firm um, <clears throat> uh, through the decades, a high of about seven dollars a pound, um, uh, up to 2008 um, when uh, the financial crisis hit us internationally and hit the lobster industry hard. Um, at that point, the, um, the, the price of lobsters plummeted to um, just over $2 a pound and, um, and has been sort of on a free fall since that was exacerbated by the 2012 um, uh, ocean heat wave, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but at this point, we're at about a 50-year low uh, in real dollar value um, uh, for the product, which is causing a lot the, the industry a lot of heartburn. Um, but let's drill into the landings on a more of a state-by-state -state basis within the U.S. waters, and um, it's pretty clear what's driving that surge in lobster uh, uh, landings um, in the U.S., and that's the harvest in Maine. Maine harvests about um, two-thirds uh, or more of the harvest in, uh, in the U.S. waters. Um, and we've been seeing a dramatic boom, especially since about uh, the late 1980s, 1990s. Um, in contrast, uh, southern New England, um, while it was starting into a boom a bit earlier, it has um, uh, fallen off dramatically, especially in, in Rhode Island. And, um, and so what I'd like to talk about a little bit is the, um, the potential role that uh, uh, non-climatic or, or secondarily climatic agents might be playing here, and that is um, uh, the ground fish depletion in, in, uh, in um, nurturing the boom in Maine uh, and, the, um, and shell disease in Rhode Island. Um, uh, influencing a, a, what is ending up being a collapse in southern New England. So let's just get into the food web, web effects here first. And I, uh, this is a pretty compelling slide here, just looking at the, um, at the uh, time trend in, um, in harvests of the, what were the two key products of, uh, from Maine, um, ground fish and lobsters, over the uh, past 60 years, and it's pretty clear that um, uh, ground fish have, um, have been dramatically depleted, and the surge in lobsters is um, significantly correlated with that. And not only has there, um, and of course this is landing, so um, this uh, combines the effects of uh, deepening uh, conservation measures that would diminish the, the uh, uh, ground fish landings. But in any case, um, it's been clear that not only have we seen uh, declining stocks of, uh, of the assemblage, um, but also uh, declining uh, body size. And so we have sort of the story of the incredible shrinking fish that is, um, uh, all has dramatically altered the function of these ground fish as, as key predators on lobsters and other mid-level consumers. So um, lobsters are king in Maine, and uh, and the Gulf of Maine right now, ground fish are, are meager um, uh, background uh, at this point in terms of, of landing. But what's, one thing that's really important to recognize about our, our part of the world is um, the contrasting thermal geography. And um, we, uh, at our doorstep, is really the, the steepest latitudinal gradient in sea temperature on the planet, and that's been um, mentioned in some of the previous uh, uh, webinars, uh, and the significance of that to um, uh, ocean acidification effect. And so, um, you know, when you uh, travel from southern New England, say Rhode Island, to um, eastern Maine during the summer, you're traversing a, a gradient in the surface temperature ranging from uh, about 20, 25 degrees in the inland water, in the um, uh, 
uh, coastal waters to uh, thermal maxes only in the 12 to 13 degree range uh, in, in the eastern Maine coastal current. Um, <clears throat> so this is a really significant, um, this aspect of the oceanography is really significant to lobster uh, distributions uh, and biology. Um, and biogeography. Now, um, in terms of uh, thermal um, temperature trends uh, in the area over the over the past, say, um, 30 uh, years or so, um, uh, Petri et al. produced this um, uh, uh, nice uh, set of trajectories, thermal tra trajectories, in different boxes along the Scotia. Ocean Shelf and Fundy area, all of which is to say, in short, that um, we've been seeing since the 1980s a uh, 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 temperature increase on the order of 0.3 to 1.4 uh, degrees Celsius over the, over the past uh, over the 25 years up to 2010. Um, and so, um, how where does the lobster fit into this? Um, into this story, and how does uh, uh, thermal uh, do temperature changes affect lobsters? Well, you can't think of temperature change um, on its own because um, the lobster sort of comfort physiological comfort zone is affected by the interaction uh, between temperature, salinity, and oxygen, and this, this has long been well known. So that um, uh, as you move into uh, for example, um, uh, lower salinities, um, the, the thermal uh, tolerance range um, diminishes. And conversely, uh, as you um, uh, move into um, uh, higher temperatures, the salinity range of salinity tolerance uh, becomes more limited. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, we've been monitoring um, the distribution of, um, of newly settled lobsters uh, along the coast of, uh, of New England and Atlantic Canada. Um, this is just a map of, um, of the sites that are suction sampled using a diver-based methodology. <clears throat> and, um, and we've been monitoring some of these sites for as long as uh, 25 years, going back to 1989. And so we're starting to see some interesting trends here. Um, these different uh, 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 bubbles here in the graph represent regional averages that are represented, represented by multiple sites. This is an effort that's supported by the uh, different state agencies from Rhode Island up to uh, Maine and then carrying over to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, supported by um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, what is, uh, I wanted to just bring your attention to the northern and, and uh, southern extremes here in that uh, while we've seen um, rather dramatic increases in the uh, larval settlement in um, in northern waters, the in southern New England, um, numbers have been um, distressingly been falling off uh, uh, steadily um, uh, uh, as the decade has uh, has progressed, and the different regions uh, in between have various versions of of that theme. With the middle ground, for example. Um, uh, mid coast Maine here staying relatively relatively constant <clears throat> um, and so how does this relate to the thermal uh, changes in in Maine uh, and the Gulf of Maine? Um, well one thing that's Im important to know is how larvae um, uh, behave relative to the the thermocline and and um, uh, temperatures in the water. This is from a study by um, Eric Annis here at the University of Maine back in, the, uh, in 2005. He published in LNO. And um, what he did was literally to follow um, uh, post-larval lobsters um, in the water column. You can see them in the water 
um, as you're diving. And he, uh, so, so Annis carried a CTD with him as he followed these, these post larvae during their settlement dives. And he noticed that they um, never went deeper than, uh, than uh, an isotherm of 12 degrees uh, Celsius as they, um, as they started to dive into the thermocline. Um, and they spent most of their time in uh, and around uh, between 14 and 18 degrees, less time too at the at the warm end in 20 degrees if there was any. Uh, and so this sort of sets a thermal threshold for lobster settlement, and that's especially significant in eastern Maine where waters often don't get much warmer than 12 degrees or haven't historically. Well, um, but if if uh, those temperatures start rising and the thermocline deep, deepens or the, the, the um, well-mixed waters of eastern Maine start rising above uh, 12 degrees, we might see <coughs> settlement. So, um, and in fact, that's what we're, that's one hypothesis that we're advancing to explain the expansion of settlement into eastern Maine waters that we hadn't seen there earlier. Well, let's go to southern New England at the southern end of the range and um, see how things have changed there. And we're fortunate to have a long time series of temperatures um, compiled from uh, work by Scott Nixon going back to the 1880s. And um, interestingly, um, up until 1940, about 1945, temperatures were uh, in the bay falling a bit, but then they started launching in into a, a dramatic increase um, uh, in the late uh, in the late 50s, but there was sort of a, a hump there, a warm spell in the 50s. Um, I put this uh, 20 degree uh, a red bar at this 20 degree um, uh, uh, marker here, um, just to uh, bring your attention to 20 degrees as being sort of a oh, what uh, the consensus has is a, as a sort of a thermal threshold for, uh, for lobsters uh, physiologically. And there are a few citations down below there that um, make a case for 20 degrees being significant in terms of, um, of uh, much above that you get um, immune system comp the immune system compromised, um, phagocytic activity compromised, even higher mortality. And so um, it's always been <coughs> as, a, as a threshold. Um, but uh, in the past few decades, we've seen um, a temperature increase in southern New England on the order of about one degree over uh, in a 33-year period. Um, <coughs> and what's that, what that's meant, I sort of arrived on the scene in 1990 when things were still relatively comfortable for lobsters. What, uh, and, and we did a comprehensive survey of lobster nurseries in, in uh, Narragansett Bay. And uh, you can see that you know, these, the blue dots indicate um, where uh, lobster nurseries were well populated. And um, you, we redid that comprehensive analysis in the last, uh, uh, in a, a couple years ago, in 2011 and 2012. And um, lobster distribution had receded dramatically into just the immediate outer coast. So um, uh, things are becoming a little less comfortable for lobsters uh, in those um, inner uh, bay waters. And their numbers are, are diminishing as well. And we're just not seeing the uh, replenishment of new cohorts entering the population the way uh, we did in 1990. Um, and uh, during that study, we also did a um, complete uh, hydrographic survey uh, at these sites, getting measures of salinity, temperature, DO, and, and pH. And um, uh, uh, at this whole set of sites, and um, you can see on this particular survey in August uh, that most of the sites were well above um, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, both at the surface and the bottom. And um, 
and also um, dissolved oxygen um, and pH were strongly correlated, which to me um, suggests that there's um, you know a, a strong influence of um, of uh, benthic respiration on BO and um, and uh, likely pH uh, reducing pH as a result of of CO2 accumulation. Um, <clears throat> so, but one of the consequences of um, uh, warming uh, temperatures is uh, is shell disease in southern New England, um, and this is a pretty nasty disease that infects. Uh, it's a bacterial infection that it infects the surface of the shell, creating um, some pretty serious that can, uh, in the shell, that can uh, be lethal in an advanced stage like, like this. And this just gives you a histological view of the degree of pitting. Um, secondary infections also um, uh, prevail. But um, uh, this disease has progressed from the Rhode Island Sound waters in southern New England, Buzzards Bay, into um, uh, this started in, in uh, the late 90s and 1997, came on with a vengeance in southern New England. We're looking at about 30% uh, uh, prevalence rates, 20, 20 to 30% prevalence rates that persist today. Uh, but um, in the early part of the uh, millennium, um, the disease started wrapping around Cape Cod <clears throat> and then stalled out for uh, several years at Cape Ann um, with very few observations, um, you know, a few in a thousand lobsters uh, m much north of there until just the past two years where um, uh, we've seen about a tenfold increase in shell disease, at least in western Maine, um, that is from Penobscot Bay, which is here, um, uh, to the uh, west. And so we're looking at it's gone from a few in a thousand to a few in a hundred to a few percent, one or two percent uh, prevalence. And this is um, this is uh, causing the industry and managers a, a lot of concern. Um, but um, there are other uh, subsequent um, climate-related events that um, that have wreaked havoc with with uh, lobsters in southern New England. The um, Long Island Sound lobster die-off in 1999 is often cited um, as a perfect storm of extremes where we had a hot, hot summer, low dissolved oxygen, um, followed by a wind-induced mixing down into the water column by um, the remnants of Hurricane Floyd. Normally, lobsters uh, find refuge in the cool, deeper waters. But when this uh, warm, low DO water was mixed down, it um, it started to uh, thermally stress lobsters, and then insult was added to injury with uh, a historic rainfall that created a low salinity shock, and re ultimately resulted in a, in a 75 to 95 percent collapse of the lobster fishery. And um, the fishery has, in Long Island Sound has simply not recovered from that. Um, the, the stock remains dramatically depleted. So Rhode Island and southern New England are, uh, Rhode Island and, and uh, Connecticut are, uh, are in a pretty bad state. Um, you know, we also had a, a sort of an ocean heat wave. Uh, it was really a uh, historic um, uh, heat wave for the North Atlantic in, in that it was some of the highest temperatures ever recorded in 2012. Um, this following, you know, looking at this time series here of, of temperatures, what was an increasing trend um, <clears throat> uh, of um, about a one degree increase every 40 years. But since 2004, things have accelerated. If you start your time series from from uh, 2004 uh, and uh, calculate that slope, we're looking at a one degree uh, Celsius change every four years. Now, of course, you know you can pick your year where you start and get a different rate, but uh, the point is there's been a dramatic acceleration with um, 2012 being um, a, a historic high, and the consequences of this um, in the Gulf were actually to augment lobster growth
growth rates. It meant an early it meant an early molt, uh, onset of the molt, which um, meant lobsters recruited to the fishery early by growth. And um, and so we're seeing here the um, season the uh, seasonal climatology of the um, of the temperature time trend from 1982 to 2011 here and 2012 uh, relative to that the blue is a stand the standard error so um, we're we're um, well above the norm most of the um, for virtually the entire year. And that, as I said, um, advanced the molt to occur earlier in the season um, and uh, to the point where uh, the Maine lobsterman was now selling lobsters to Canadian processors at a time when the Canadians hadn't finished their winter fishery. And so it put a glut of lobsters on the, on the um, market uh, and caused the, the price to collapse. So um, in these three different places, we've seen some extreme temperature events that affected lobsters and lobster men. Uh, again, the 1997 onset of shell disease that still persists has resulted in a collapse in 1999, mass mortality in, in Long Island Sound, another collapse, and the early molt in 2012 <coughs> from the uh, ocean heat wave, which um, didn't result by any measure in a collapse, but only a, a price drop. Um, so you can say that the price perhaps collapsed, but uh, abundance remains high. Um, so what about acidification, uh, acidification effects now? I've sort of run through the um, gamut of uh, food web and thermal effects, results of the fishing down the food web uh, uh, with um, depleting um, uh, the, the predatory ground fish. But what about uh, acidification effects? Well, <clears throat> um, we've, we've seen these graphs of, um, of uh, atmospheric um, CO2 change and the resultant, resultant um, uh, change in pH that, uh, that's projected over the next century. I'd like to... Um, focus on levels uh, that um, are painted for um, the, the present day and for um, uh, about 40 years out, mid-century. Um, and uh, so a little bit of background is in order here. Um, and I, uh, I, I have to confess here, I, <laughs> I, um, I, I studied um, uh, Joe Salisbury's um, uh, webinar very carefully for this this slide, and and he uh, very nice the 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 key point here that um, uh, shell making um, marine calcifiers depend on this reaction here to use um, the carbonate ion and calcium ions in the um, in the water column to create uh, calcium carbonate. Uh, skeleton, and um, one of the very useful indices um, is uh, the saturation index, um, indicated by uh, uh, omega here. Um, uh, the saturation index for the mineral aragonite. You can also um, do a similar saturation index for for calcite. Um, calcite is very relevant to um, to to crustaceans as well. But um, the saturation uh, index is uh, simply the product of the concentration of the um, calcium ion times the um, car concentration of the carbonate ion divided by uh, the solubility co coefficient. And the important thing to remember uh, is that um, uh, as long as the um, saturation index is uh, greater than one, um, uh, calcite or aragonite can form, and a animals can can um, can make a shell. Um, and 
it becomes increasingly easy uh, for animals to make shells as the index becomes super saturated, as seawater becomes super saturated um, with uh, calcium and, and um, carbonate. But um, you don't want to go less than, than one um, <clears throat> uh, because shells and um, the uh, crystals uh, dissolve at, um, <laughs> at uh, indices lower than one. It becomes, a, a, in other words, a, a corrosive environment. Well, it's also important to know that, um, that uh, uh, some species need to have even uh, well-elevated um, thresholds of, um, of, uh, of uh, saturation index. So simply being a one uh, above uh, an omega of one doesn't quite cut it for, uh, for uh, most species. And in fact, um, as Joe Salisbury's work sh has shown, um, coupled with Mark Hint's work, that, um, for example, clam larvae re uh, really uh, most efficiently um, uh, uh, grow shells at a, um, an omega of 1.6. And, um, and corals are even more, um, um, more restricted in that they require a threshold uh, for optimal growth of about three. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, it's really important to, um, uh, for these species to reside in environments that, um, that uh, uh, have some supersaturated um, uh, omegas. Um, <clears throat> so um, just to look at this at a global scale, we, um, we see that uh, um, in near present day here, we've got PCO2 values of about um, uh, 380 parts per million. That translates a pH of about 8.1, roughly, um, and, uh, and uh, a saturation level of, in the US um, northeast of about 3 to 4. Um, but remember, we're on this very steep gradient here uh, inside the, these red boxes. And um, we're dealing with a dramatic temperature gradient. <clears throat> in in uh, colder water, um, the omega becomes more corrosive. And in fresher water, omega becomes more corrosive, lower, that is. Um, and couple that with the anticipated increase in, in um, PCO2, uh, uh, by mid-century, we're looking at um, pHs of less than 8 and, um, and omegas dropping uh, a full point to a range of 2 and 3. And I've even heard, uh, as you get, Joe talk about, um, omegas far less than that as you get into coastal and estuarine waters. So I'm going to just um, review quickly to um, wrap up here um, three case studies, two on the American lobster, or no, um, one that actually includes the American lobster, one that includes Comaris gamaris, the congener, the European lobster, and one that, um, that includes uh, uh, two Pacific uh, crabs, the, the king crab and, and tanner crab. I, I just want to bring your attention to a, a very useful recent review by Whiteley um, that's a, a review of ecological responses of crustaceans in general uh, to ocean acidification. Um, but here I'll take a, a bit of a focus on lobsters since White asked me to, and that's our theme here. And, um, and this is, a, a, this is really one of the first landmark studies to look at ocean acidification effects on marine calcifiers. Lobsters were among them. Um, and you can see these different calcifiers had different kinds of responses. We've heard about the mollusks largely having a, a positive response to increasing um, saturation levels. Makes a lot of sense. Um, 
the uh, uh, surprising difference about crustaceans, or at least um, decapods, seems to be that um, uh, calcification um, uh, decreases with, with increasing uh, saturation levels. Um, which is uh, rather surprising, and I think the mechanism has yet, yet to be worked out, but you, you see here that um, lobsters are not only tolerant to um, uh, rather corrosive waters, but they become, uh, they uh, increase their calcification rates. And so these are the, the treatments. It's important to note that they were done, at, this was done at 25 degrees Celsius, which is well above the um, uh, uh, thermal um, comfort zone for lobsters. So um, it would be interesting to do this at more um, uh, ambient levels, uh, um, typical of the Gulf of Maine. Um, <clears throat> another study by uh, of European lobster, this one focused on larval effects. I'll just bring your attention uh, quickly to the point that there are, three, there, there are three larval stages, and then there's a metamorphosis to the um, post-larval stage that looks a lot like a lobster. Take-home message here is that um, uh, calcification levels were um, pretty similar um, among the three larval stages, but dropped significantly at the fourth stage. This is the stage that where you're starting to get exoskeleton development. So there seems to be a a cost here, but um, there was no effect on survival, development time, or growth uh, uh, for Homaris gamers. Similar study has not been done for the American lobster that's of any quality um, that I know of. Um, <clears throat> and finally, um, I wanted to just uh, bring your attention to this work on king crab and tanner crab because um, it's yet another that looks at, at survivability and growth, and in this case, um, a, uh, uh, there was a, definitely a negative effect on, of acidification on growth, um, and, I'm sorry, on, on survival here and on growth uh, under these um, rather extreme um, uh, conditions, very, very corrosive conditions and, uh, in the uh, in the highest PCO2 um, uh, treatment. And, re and remember, this is very cold water, four to eight degrees um, for, uh, for, for these species. Um, so uh, final major slide here is just, you know, this brings your attention to the mechanisms operating in, in calcification uh, <clears throat> uh, at the uh, uh, tissue level um, in the exoskeleton. So we're looking at the, um, uh, this is a, a study done by Kunkel et al. Uh, he's done some really fine structure analyses of the American lobster exoskeleton and basically to whip through these, um, these uh, different layers. We've got this, uh, first of all, you've got the, the um, blood uh, pH at about um, uh, on the acid side, whereas your ambient seawater pH is going to be up around 7.8, 8.2. Bottom water is probably closer to the 7.8 level. But then you have this, un uh, as you move down through the exoskeleton, <clears throat> you um, enter this unstirred layer that's essentially basic. Um, because you're accumulating hydroxyl ions out here, um, and is somewhat thought to be somewhat antibiotic, uh, and thus a barrier to um, to bacterial infection. Then you work your way through the first um, bar uh, physical barrier, the epicuticle, which regulates dissolution of the calcite layer, which is just below it in the exocuticle, and then you get further down into um, what are referred to as trabiculae, it's mainly a matrix of, um, of appetite uh, that's embedded in, a, in an amorphous car calcium carbonate. And um, uh, if there's an injury to the exoskeleton, it makes uh, more of this, uh, uh, carbon, this amorphous carbonate, calcium carbonate, available to the exterior and may be a path for, uh, for invasion of disease. Um, <clears throat> so uh, 
uh, let me just wrap up with this laundry list of, um, uh, well, first a, 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 a quote, quote, I could not have said it better myself. Dave Cousins, president of the Maine Lobstermen's Association, um, Bangor Daily News, he said it well. We don't really know the effects of ocean acidification on lobsters, but we do know the effects on shellfish and clams, and it's not positive. As long as the industrial nations of the world use fossil fuel, it's going to get worse. Um, he said it well. But here's the challenges to the fishery, and this is my last slide. Um, the lobster range is clearly shifting northward. We're see, going to be seeing increasing losses in southern New England, as far as I can tell, and a deepening of the population down there to offshore, wa offshore deeper waters. Um, we have uh, a worrisome expanding prevalence of shell disease, and the industry is contending with that. Um, uh, they're also dealing with the increasing cost of fishing and the dropping value of the product, and, um, and they're uh, hard work at work mitigating that as good businessmen they are. Um, and uh, and these, uh, these extreme climate events have taken the industry by surprise, and so uh, that brings me to the scientific challenges ahead. Um, and we, we've got to reconcile some of these stage and species-specific differences in OA effects, uh, those opposite uh, uh, effects of, um, of PCO2 on calcification on, in different organisms is intriguing, and the mechanisms need to be understood. Um, we've, um, we've got to also put uh, acidification effects in perspective relative to other physical and biotic drivers of uh, recruitment and lobster abundance. Um, and that's why I felt it important to, to do that up um, uh, perspective. Uh, <clears throat> uh, understanding how shell disease is linked to uh, temperature and OA effects, if at all, is, um, is going to involve a better understanding of the skeleton mineralogy. Um, and physiology behind shell deposition. Um, and we've got to understand other, the other processes that uh, ocean acidification and temperature affect, including gene expression, protein function, uh, oxygen binding, immunology, hormonal controls, and so on. Um, we haven't seen any long-term studies on, on growth or survival yet, lifelong uh, growth studies, that is. Um, these have mostly been short-term uh, studies, and so we need to expand our, our, our view there. And nobody's done any uh, work on um, the population level, looking at um, microevolutionary responses uh, with um, OA and temperature being an important selective agent and operating at different levels, um, intensities regionally. Um, and the uh, last two things, um, uh, what are the implications for trophic interactions? If calcification is so uh, if shells are softening, does that make lobsters more prone to predators? And finally, predicting these extreme events. Um, we're doing a fair job of predicting the long-term trends and the means, but these extreme events seem to be the main uh, factors that are affecting um, uh, distributions in the northward shift. Um, so I'll stop there. I know I ran a little bit long there, but um, I, I think I captured it. Thank you, folks. Great.